Everybody shout with me. The stone, hold it up. Say, the stone that killed my Goliath. Say it again. The stone that killed my Goliath. Everybody's got a Goliath. I know, sounds like bad news, but it's life. Everyone's got giants in our life. Things that we want to conquer. Could be a habit. Could be a lack of a good habit. It could be something like just no sleep at night. That's a Goliath. I mean, sleep is important. I think that's one of my Goliaths. 1 Samuel 17, 34, 37. Thank you, Pastor and Sister Woodward, for first of all, being our friends. Sister Beverly, you're amazing. You got a great pastor, y'all. I don't know whether he's watching it, but we got to give Pastor and Sister Woodward a hand. I know he's in Denver, Colorado. I know he's speaking tonight, and he'll be back. But they are wonderful friends, have taken great care of us, and I honor them. Pastor and Sister Jack Lehman, Pastor and Sister Kathy, you're a wonderful. They are good people. Thank you, Jesus, for great leaders. Pastor Matt, thank you for being our friend. All the good things you do. The multicultural team, we need to give the multicultural outreach team a great big hand. They've done a great job. Every one of them. Every one. And I thank God for them. 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37. Can you imagine? As of right now, 14 people have got the Holy Ghost and several of them Muslims. Come on now. There is a breakthrough among multicultural internationals in Fredericton. There is a breakthrough. Remember the last time we were here, we talked about that open window. That window is still open. That light is still shining through. And you need to take the opportunity of an open window and go stand right there. And walk through that open window. Walk through those open doors. Because open means it can also shut. And I don't want to wait for it to shut. I want it to be open. I want it to be remain open in, in, over Fredericton, over CCC till Jesus comes back. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him, killed him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the... You see, David is telling Saul, let me tell you something. I'm not sure what I can do, but I know what my God has already done. So I can at least go by what he's done to expect what he's going to do. Because he, God said he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if yesterday he healed someone, today he can heal again. If yesterday he restored a relationship, today he can restore again. That's, that's what David was, was trying to say. And I'm, I'm going to let you sit down in a minute. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine. That's really an insulting thing for the Hebrew children to say. That means they're not even part of God. Uncircumcised. You're not part of the covenant. You're an outsider. You don't bear the mark that makes you one of us. That's why baptism in Jesus' name is important. It's a circumcision of the heart. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. He was actually waving God's resume. I like it. God's resume. God has a CV. God has a CV. He was saying, hey, you want to see what God has done? The same God that has delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. I want to jump to verse 49 and David put his hand I mean he talked a few more things and then he said David David put his hand in his bag and everybody hold it up he took thence a stone keep, keep your stone in your hand even when you're seated he took a stone and he put it in that slingshot and he slang it one stone he had five I still don't know exactly why he picked five, but he was a calculated risk taker. 
And he smote the Philistine in his forehead and the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Then David went, took the Philistine, took Goliath's sword and cut his head off. David just wanted to make sure Goliath never rose up again. You may be seated with your stone. Satan vies for your bedside position. Hoping to be the first voice you hear. He covets your waking thoughts. You understand what that means. Satan, anybody here, the moment you wake up, there's some negative thought that comes. You didn't even think negative. You went to bed probably reasonably happy, reasonably contented, just extremely tired. But you wake up and there are sometimes just negative thoughts that come to you even before your day has started. Anybody except other than me? Thank you for being honest. Satan vies for your bedside position. He covets your thoughts. He awakes you with words of worry and stirs you with thoughts of stress. If you dread the day even before you begin your day, mark it down. Your giant has been by your bed. And he's just getting warmed up. He breathes down your neck as you eat your breakfast. Whispers in your ear as you walk out the door, shadows your steps, sticks to your hip, and he lies. Everybody say, he lies. Everybody say, devil, you're a liar. I'm going to say a few things, and you're going to shout back, devil, you're a liar to me. Is that okay? All right, okay. Your children are lost. He lied. Your marriage is dead, Satan. You're not going to be able to save this relationship, the devil is saying. You can't reach this city. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wish he'd came to last night's service. He probably was there. Right at the back, thinking how he could do anything, couldn't do anything, you know. You can't reach this city. Devil, you're a liar. We baptized 14, and most of them was internationals from this city, from different countries around the world. You're a liar. He says, your kids are not coming home. Nobody cares. People are not interested in God in 2017. That is so 1947. No, it's not. It's actually November 2017. If you try to live a holy life, you are not going to fit in with your friends. You're going to look different. Don't try to practice separation. It doesn't work anymore in today's society. Devil, you're a liar. There are people that want this. They are hungry for the real deal. They don't want games. They don't want church to play games. They want the real deal. If you're going to be an ordinary Christian that comes in, clocks in, and clocks out, you will repulse them. But if you are on fire and you will give it your all, they will follow you home. They will come to you. They will talk to you. They will desire your counsel. But be real. Jesus is real, you know. If he lives in you, we ought to be real. No masks. No agenda. Just real. If you love people sincerely and completely, it is a magnet to those that are hungry and thirsty for God. Goliaths roam this world. Debt, disaster, danger, deceit, depression. Supersized challenges still swagger and strut. They pilfer your sleep and embezzle your peace and joy. But they cannot dominate you. Shout that out. They cannot dominate me. You know how to deal with them. Because you know you have learned. Especially here at CCC. I know you pray. You had Wednesday night prayer here. And Wednesday night somewhere else. We were having a time of it. And somebody received the Holy Ghost. Someone received the Holy Ghost because you were praying here. Someone received the Holy Ghost in our apartment. Why? Because you know how to deal with your giants. You face giants by facing God first. You have learned to face God first before going out in the field bare hand. Plug into the Holy Ghost, my friends. We're at war. We are at war. I know that it's been great that 14 have got the Holy Ghost. Well, maybe a few more tonight but and next Sunday and next Sunday. But it's not just that. You are at war. You're doing spiritual warfare even now. There was a wonderful, beautiful Muslim lady this morning when I was having a Bible study with her in the office. She turned around and looked at me and said, will you baptize me? 
I mean, I'm talking about there is an open door with a particular culture here that I have never seen. She said, I, I want this. I'm tired of religion. I don't want religion. I want a relationship. She said, I said, well, you've come to the right place then. And she said, will you baptize me? I said, absolute baptism is not religion, by the way. It's a beginning of entering into a covenant, a real relationship with God. Every relationship has terms and conditions. If you're thinking, oh, a relationship is free for all, I can do what I like, and the person, other person in the relationship will do what he likes or whatever, that's not a relationship. I don't know what that's a mess. It's a mess. It's a chaotic mess, and the relationship won't last. Every relationship has terms and conditions. A marriage relationship, you sign papers. You, you, you agree even before God what your responsibility, every relationship has responsibilities to give and take, to respect and to love. God's relationship is no different. There are responsibilities. And so baptism is a, one of the terms of the relationship. And she looked at me and, and she said to me, she said, you know, um, I want to do this. It, it was so powerful. Satan is not letting up, my friends. We need to fight for our cities, our families, and our own souls. God showed up this past week that your community outreach is going to explode and multiply. The kind of warfare I'm talking about is not screaming at the enemy or to even debate him. You do not have to use your volume of your voice to intimidate the devil. The name alone is sufficient. The blood that is applied on you through baptism is sufficient. The spirit of God that has filled you is sufficient. Do you agree with me? Then you can shout and clap because you have the weapons of your warfare. This kind of warfare I'm talking about, like I said, it's not, don't, don't be wasting time debating, debating. You're saved. You've got God and you've got his light. You don't have to argue and debate your viewpoint with others. You just love people and let God do the rest. You don't have to enter into a debate. Jesus is not asking for lawyers. He's asking for witnesses. Witnesses. You don't have to be judge, jury, and executioner. You just have to be a witness. And to resist Satan is this. Very easy. Well, actually, doing it is not really very easy. But I'm going to say it. This is, this is, it's, it's a simple formula, if you like. This is how you resist the enemy. You stand firm in your belief that Jesus is greater than Satan. That's it. If you will stand firm in your belief that Jesus is greater than Satan and that your relationship is with Jesus, the one that's greater. If you would stand firm in your belief that Jesus is greater than the devil and that you are in relationship with Jesus, you are resisting the enemy. Every time there's a challenge, a temptation, you can stand firm. You can resist the devil and he will flee. Love the Lord. Obey him. Live an obedient life to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. The statement, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, is not a statement. It's not an admonition. It's a command. The, the, it's a commandment. Be strong. That's a commandment. There's no option there. And in the power of his might. God does not command us to do things we cannot do. God is not a mean God. Not telling us to do things that is so hard we cannot do it. He, he doesn't, I'm not saying that he gives us a free pass to do whatever we want. But he asks us to stand in his strength. We can resist. There is nothing more powerful than a praying child of God. Jesus is raising up a remnant that is not afraid to call on God. Are you afraid to call on God? I think not. That's why we've had so many Holy Ghosts. When Brother Robinette was here, there was eight that received it on a Sunday. 
There are people that I would have never thought would accept the Lord or would give their life to Jesus, would even want to discuss Jesus, or want Jesus right now, want to be baptized, want the Holy Ghost. Are you afraid to call on the Lord? Well, call on the Lord. Lift up your hands. Call on the Lord right now. What, your, what is your need? Just call on the Lord. Say, God, this is my need. I want you to do this for me. I need you. I want you to meet me. I want you to meet my need. Call on the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. He's raising up a remnant that's not afraid to call on him. He's raising up a people that's not afraid to call on him. To intercede for a lost and dying world. That would push away from food. And from to consecrate significant amounts of time to seek him. Focus on your giants and you will stumble. You focus on God, your giants will tumble. You know that what David knew and you do what David did tonight. I challenge you one more time. Pick up this stone. Pick up this stone and make a decision right now. I'm going to ask you to call this the stone of prayer. Can you shout that out with me? Stone of prayer. You know what I did? I took a stone one time and I took a sharpie. Well, this is a dark stone. If you got a dark stone, you got to use a silver or a gold sharpie. I used a black sharpie. My stone was kind of white. And I wrote prayer on one side. Shout it out, the stone of prayer. I'm talking to the body tonight. I feel to talk to the body tonight. I feel to talk to CCC. Brother Marshall and I, God willing, we're be, we'll be coming back, I think, in... May or some point in spring, we're coming back to Fredericton. I feel it's such a long time away, but we're coming back when the weather is more <laughs> evangelizing friendly, outreach friendly weather, you know. Peace, the Bible says, peace is promised to the one who fixes his thoughts and desires on God. Am I right? That's Bible. Everybody say it's Bible. Don't let, let, don't let down your stone. Don't put your stone away. Hold it in your hand. I dare not face my giant without first doing the same. Without first fixing my thoughts and desires on God. Prayer spawned David's successes. When Saul's soldiers tried to capture him, David turned towards God. How do you survive a fugitive life in a cave? I don't think any of us who live in modern day today can, can survive a fugitive life. That means a life cut off fugitive, meaning somebody is coming after you to kill you or to arrest you or take you away. That's a fugitive. You're running from the law. You're running from your enemies. And David ran and he hid in a cave for a long, long time. People he loved and, and mentored and, and, and trusted were after him to take his life. How do you live a fugitive life in a cave? Because... It was prayer that spawned it. Prayer undergirded him. David turned toward God. David cried out to God in prayer. You have been my defense, he says in Psalms 59. You have been my refuge in the day of trouble. And when David cried out to God and cried out, look at his Psalms. When you look at his fugitive day Psalms, it's always desperate cries for rescue. He had a stone. Now, when he was a young boy, he slang that stone and he threw that stone that killed Goliath, a Philistine soldier, double his size, triple his size and strength. But now David was in the fugitive cave. He had another Goliath he was facing in the cave, fear. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he faced depression. When your loved ones turn against you, you think you're not going to be depressed, anxious, fearful, angry, desolate betrayed, abandoned, rejected. You're going to face all of that. Those are your Goliath. That's when you take the stone of prayer and you cry out to God, you are my refuge. You have been my defense in the time of trouble. Come on, let's do that. You have been my defense. In the, if you are feeling desolate, alone, depressed, anxious, fearful about anything, anything, worried about your future, Worried about money. Worried about family. God, you are my refuge in the day of my trouble. 
When David soaked his mind in God, he stood. When he didn't, he flopped. Somehow I don't think David spent a lot of time praying the night he seduced Bathsheba. Do you? No, he did not. Somehow he missed prayer meeting at church that night. He probably missed several prayer meetings. Because you don't just get up one day and decide to seduce somebody else's wife. Let me just get frank here. I just love Canadians. I can just say what I like and they're tough. Bring it on. You don't have to frill it or frou-frou it for us. We're tough. Why do you think I'm coming back? I need some of your toughness. No, he was not spending time praying. The evening he decided to take somebody else's wife. Probably several prayer meetings had gone past. He didn't have a prayer life, I'm sure. Not just that day, but days for him to make that decision. You think that David was writing a psalm the night he decided to murder Uriah? No. David had made, probably not been connected with God when he made an instant decision to take the life of a man that was innocent. It doesn't happen overnight. Sin never does. If we're going to reach this city, we're going to have to go back and take the stone of prayer and slang it and throw it against some Goliaths we have. Habits, good habits of prayer, bad habits of a prayerless life. Kill our Goliaths that are trying to hinder us and distract us from doing what God wants us to do. If you agree with me, why don't you clap and shout to God. I'm talking to you today about the stone that kills your Goliath. The most urgent need of the church today is to know Jesus through a deep life-changing relationship. With rela Everybody say relationship. Everybody say relationship. Intentional prayer. The pursuit of his presence is the foundational step in the dynamic, empowering intimacy with Jesus Christ. There is no way that my husband and I would even dare cross over the border and come to a land where there are wonderful things going on and great communities and a solid church like CCC. But there are communities and strongholds and satanic stuff going on as well over there, across the border and over here. Do you think that we would dare come to somewhere that's not really really familiar and do some Bible study and prayer and services without prayer. We would be foolish to do so. And I realized this time that it was slightly different from the last time. We were talking about it with Pastor Jack and I was talking about it, Sister Beverly as well. And it was different. Meaning that the last time there were baptisms from the get-go, this time it was all converging. Last time uh, it was different groups of people, this time it was different groups. It was just a, a difference, not bad, not good, just different. And God just impressed on me that the next time we come, the church as a whole, we need to be on a prayer and fasting chain for about a week, two, I don't care. Your pastor will let you know. A week, two weeks, 30 days. How many here you join us? That we would take turns. We don't have to pray fast all 30 days, but we could take turns. Everybody do a day. 30 people, 30 days. And pull down strongholds. Then as a church, we would go out there and do Bible studies. And win souls and get into communities that have never heard of the name. Amen? I am thirsty for more, people. Are you thirsty for more? I need regular swallows from God's reservoir in countless situations, stressful family issues, demanding trips, character testing decisions. Many times a day, I have to step into the underground spring of God and receive a new, uh, uh, his work for my sins. I have to receive anew the power of his spirit. I have to receive anew his lordship and his love and must take whatever steps necessary. I must take whatever steps necessary to keep the living voice of Christ speaking with me through cultivating intimacy with the sovereign God. It is a spiritually intentional act of relating to God. I don't care if it takes 15 minutes to crucify your flesh or two hours. Some people it might take two hours. I probably need two hours to crucify me. 
with all the issues I have, I need at least two hours to crucify my flesh. You might only need 15. It doesn't matter. Everybody's flesh acts in different ways. Everybody's challenges in your flesh are different. If it takes 15 minutes or two hours, do it. But do it because you love him. Amen? Do it because you want this relationship with him. Take that stone. Come on, take it up. Say the stone of prayer. Say it out loud. The stone of prayer. Say I'm going to take whatever steps necessary to keep his voice in my life. I'm going to cultivate prayer. Say it. I'm going to take my Goliath down. Private prayer. Small group prayer. Congregational prayer. Extraordinary times of prayer, adoring prayer, intercessory prayer, requesting prayer, prevailing prayer, warfare prayer. The Bible says all prayer. This is the soil in which intimacy with God is established so that we will know him. And like my husband said this morning, not just know about him, but know him. And no amount of money, no amount of genius or culture can move things for God. I don't care how genius we are, how rich we are, how clever we are, how gifted or talented we are. My talent, my gifts, my money, or whatever that's left of it, cannot move things for God. My gifts and talents cannot. But if I cry out in desperation and get a hold of prayer, I can move God. Time and time again in the pages of the Bible, prayer has moved God. Not gifts, talents, money, and good looks and charm. Prayer has moved God. This is the soil. This is the soil in which intimacy with God is established. The whole man and woman and young people aflame with desire for more of God, more faith, more prayer, more zeal, more consecration. And as believers, we must be the incarnation of this God-inflamed devotedness. God will always have his church. He will always have a church. But we need to be set apart. Of, set apart. As people that know him, that pray. You cannot know him without praying. I'm sorry. You can't. You can't read about him in a book. I don't care who wrote it. You can read about him in a book and they could describe him to a T. They could have pictures of God. Not really. They could try. They could describe him to you and they could have all of those fancy words and theology coming out to try to prove to you who he is and where he is and where he's seated and what he can do. And all that is great. But if you don't pray, you will never know him. You will always have someone else's opinion of him. And that's not enough. Someone else's, my opinion of God will never be driving you. It cannot motivate you in the long run. Someone else's opinion of God will not motivate you in the long run. When your testing kind, uh, time comes, your personal relationship with Christ is what will keep you. Amen? You don't have to live with a dryness deep within your soul. Prayer is where I can drink deeply and often. You know, that's why John in 4, even Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him. Yes, of course, he was talking about the Holy Ghost. He was referring to the Holy Ghost. Water signifies many times in the Bible, water is a symbol of his spirit. But we cannot be full of the Holy Ghost if we're not communicating with him. If we're just, you know, one time there's somebody who told me back, back home, they said, well, I serve him. You know, I'm a volunteer, I do this, I do that, I serve him, I run around, I'm exhausted for Jesus. Why am I exhausted and tired and not motivated to really feel him? I don't feel him in church services, I don't feel him in worship, but I am tired out by just serving him. I said, because you, like, like Martha... You are cumbered about with the works of God. You are, you are trying to serve him. You are trying to please God. I'm not telling you not to serve God. But if you don't spend time drinking from the wellspring of the water of life. If you do not pray. Then none of that service is going to satisfy you. You are going to be one exhausted, dissatisfied, frustrated Christian. You can't just serve, serve, serve and not have a relationship. Sometimes I work, I serve God, and, and I'm traveling a lot. I thank God my husband supports that ministry and supports me in my travels. 
Either that or he just wants me out of the house. I'm just kidding. No, no that's not true. But, but um, he, he supports my, the ministry in the ladies' conference. And I travel so much. And sometimes I'm away one week, four days here. Five, you know, twice a month I travel. And sometimes it's so exhausting when I'm walking with my uh, hand luggage from Terminal A to Terminal D. Right in the middle one time I just stopped and I said, you know, can you just remind me one more time why am I doing this? He said, you know what your problem is? Your problem is that you're telling everybody about me. I want you to sit with me. You need to shut yourself away from those that demand your strength, your time, and your energy, and counsel. And you need to shut yourself away with me so I can strengthen you. So I went and I, I, I said... I didn't sit in the normal gate area. I went to where it was more quiet and kind of a, um, you know, just, just a quiet area in the airport, which is almost impossible to find, but I did find one. And I just sat there and I listened to worship music and I began to just seek God quietly. You know, I just put earphones and just let God to rain on me. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. I'm tired. I'm in the middle of two gates. There are times when I wake up and I don't know which hotel I am in or which city I'm in. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm in, you know, Columbus. And then I'm, I'm actually not. I've already left Columbus last week. I'm in a new city. That kind of exhaustion is, does not glorify God. That kind of mind-numbing tiredness does not glorify God. doesn't make God happy for me to serve him and serve him and not feel and not have him. There's a difference. And if you, if you believe that, take that stone. Close your eyes. And ask him. Ask him to fill you right now. Everyone here. Take the stone. Lift up your hands. And ask him, God. Fill my heart with your presence. Can you just pray that? Just softly. God, fill my heart with your presence. Tell him honestly you're tired. Don't pretend. Sometimes I want to pretend that everything is okay. I do. I'm being honest with you. Sometimes I want to just pretend, oh, I'm fine. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I know when I'm dry. So tell God, God, I'm dry. I'm so busy. I've got two jobs and so many bills to pay. And I'm not, I'm not as close to you as I was a year ago, a few months ago. And I want to get there, Lord. And I'm holding the stone of prayer as a reminder. It's not, it's not some icon or whatever, but it's something that's going to be a symbol to me that you are calling me to a walk with you. Help me, oh God, not to just knock myself out with two jobs and paying bills and taking care of family and have forgotten you, oh God, and pushed you away into a corner. Come on, don't stop. Don't stop. Some of you are just, some of you are just feeling it. Talk to God. I want this tonight to become a prayer meeting. I want tonight, body of Christ, to become a prayer meeting right now. Because I have Goliaths in my life. I've got situations in my family. You've got situations in your family. There are Goliaths. The enemy wants to tear families apart. And I'm going to knock that Goliath with prayer. I want to knock my Goliath down and so do you. Is your Goliath resentment, unforgiveness? Is it hurt? Is it a dryness deep within? What is your Goliath? What is your Goliath? I see some of you crying. I see some of you weeping. Let that, let that spirit of prayer and intercession flow over you. How many, how long has it been? You know that song, how long has it been since you talked with the Lord? How long has it been since you talked with him? Since you had a personal encounter with Jesus? You've got to push church. You cannot just sit there and listen to these words and clock out. You've got to push like you've never pushed before. Because I know that our community and the demands of your job demands of your commitment and responsibility will distract you in a minute the enemy knows how to get you dry the enemy knows how to distract you and seduce you away from that which is important to just focusing on the urgent 
Don't focus on the urgent. Focus on the important. And prayer and getting with God and a relationship with Christ is important. You don't have to live with a deep dryness within. Prayer is where you can drink deeply and drink often. It's 7.15. I've got a few more minutes and I'm going to close. There's another aspect of this stone that is going to take down your Goliath. Say, I'm going to take Goliath down. What is this stone? Stone of prayer. Shout it out. Stone of prayer. I'm going to take Goliath down. But there's another aspect to this stone. The stone that you have received, I'm not sure whether you could see clearly, but mine has two sides. You can never get any faith by an effort of your will. Some people say, you know, I'm, I, I, my willpower is strong. Nothing can shake me or move me. I've got strong willpower. Really? There are things that can take you down no matter how strong you are. Or how strong your willpower is. Your willpower alone cannot keep you in the straight and narrow. I don't care how strong you are. Or how many Tony Robbins CDs you've watched. Or how many pep talks you've given yourself. Or whether you're a coach of a big football club. You can never get enough faith by an effort or any effort of the will. You can never get it by trying to pump it up in any way. No song, no matter your favorite worship song, cannot pump up your faith. It can create an atmosphere where you can focus on God and focus on his love. But it cannot pump up your faith. The only secret to building your faith is within the Bible. What does the Bible say? For faith comes by and hearing that's how you get faith. So don't, 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 don't even fool yourself. I'm not going to fool myself that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have lots of faith in God without the word. It's the word that builds my faith. Prayer enables me in the presence of God to be refilled and refreshed and to be strengthened. But it's the word that builds my faith. The word is the platform for my faith. Don't fool yourself by saying, oh, I don't need to read the word. I don't need to do devotions with the word. I can have faith all by myself. Well, then that's it. Then you're saying that the word of God is a lie, and it's not. God cannot lie. When your Goliath brings you a woeful list of worries, an impossible situation, remember David? What did David do? Saul looked at him and said, you know, you look, you scrawny. You got to be outfitted to go and kill Goliath. You better be dressed right and you better have the right weapons. And David was not impressed with that heavy weaponry or the heavy armor that Saul made him wear. And David went out and he declared to Goliath. He declared to everyone that was listening in that hill of Elah, in that valley. And he declared and he said, hey, God, he was actually quoting, he quoted the history of God, the resume of God. Where is the resume of God right now? It's in the 66 books of the Bible that you carry or you've downloaded on your phone. Doesn't matter, it's the Bible. When your Goliath brings you a list of worries or an impossible situation, remember David and gaze eyeball to eyeball at God's victories. Where are God's victories recorded? In the Word. If you don't read the Word, you won't know what God has taken care of yesterday to have hope for tomorrow. You're not going to know what God has done for you yesterday to have hope for tomorrow. Grab on to Holy Scriptures. Read the amazing miracles wrought by God. If you don't understand doctrine, well, go to Bible study and ask questions. That's fine. But if all you do is read the promises of God and the miracles of God, from the Old Testament to the New, he opened the Red Sea, he killed the lion, he killed the bear, he killed Goliath, he took care of people's, uh, his children's enemy, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, lame walk, the deaf see. The deaf hear and the blind see. If you would call on Jesus, pray, intercede, and begin making a list of lion and bear-sized victories. Lion-sized victories. 
Go around telling people, last week I had a migraine, I'm healed. Last week, doctor said I had diabetes problem, but my sugar is taken care of, I'm healed. Last week, I had an accident, but God has provided. My car was total, but I got a new car. Pray the word. Everybody say, pray the word. Say, declare the word. And then you will be able to tell your friends and your family and especially Satan. You'll be able to look at devil's face and say, God has done this before. He has done it again and will do it again. Look around your church foyer. Look at the, look at the church foyer when you go out to the church foyer. Look at this church. Look around at the people that you may not have been here last year, here now. May not have been here two years ago, here now. Maybe they disappeared four years ago and suddenly walked in today. Can you see a lion's head hanging on the walls of this church? I can. Do you see a bear rug rest in the foyer of this church? I can. Remember his marvelous works which he has done. Only the word will help you catalog God's success. How many here? How many here he's walked you through high waters? Come on, now just please lift up your hands and wave it to God boldly. How many? That's a lot of people. Look around. That's a lot of people. He has walked you through high waters. How many here, you have prayed for something and God has done it for you? How many here? Lift up your hands. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Lift it up. He's done it for me. How many here, you have asked God for a miracle and you did not think he will answer, but he did. Remember. The Bible says, remember his marvelous works. Which he, how are you going to remember his marvelous works if you're not in the word? If you don't read the word, if you're not in the word, if you don't meditate and devour and eat the word, you're not going to remember his works. You won't know what he's done. Read his CV, people. Read his resume, CCC. Have you not known, I mean, have you not known his provision? How many here you did not have a job, but somehow he provided for you? Food, money, a check, mysteriously arriving. How many nights have you gone to bed hungry? Not many nights. Not many nights. Maybe not even a night. He has made roadkill of your enemies. You know what roadkill is. Yeah, I know Fredericton is too pretty to have roadkill. We live with it all the time in Louisiana. He's made roadkill out of your enemies. Write today's worries in sand, but you can chisel yesterday's victories in stone. So pick up the stone of the word. Come on, pick up your stone. Say the stone of prayer. Now turn it around. The stone of the word. You got a sharpie at home. If you don't go to the store, buy one. If your stone is dark, buy a silver gold one. Or a pink one. No, don't. Neon, a nice green neon colored pen so that when in dark you're sleeping and your Goliath comes to you and whispers terrible things to you, you turn around and you see a glinting neon word prayer at you. A friend of mine did that. She said, I'm going to put it in neon because it's always when I switch off the lights, Goliath tends to visit me. <laughs> the stone of the word. When life closes in and read the story. What story? What am I talking about when I say read the story? Where is the story? Say the Bible. It's full of stories. And, and, it's, and, and don't be like, well, how do we know the story is real? You know what? If it's a good story and it's going to, it's going to edify me, I'm going to read it. God doesn't lie. I know the word of God is true. But if you have questions about it, read it anyway. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. I've had, I've had clients in counseling say, I don't have faith for that. I've got faith for my salvation. I've got faith for this. But that's just too big. I said, the only way you are going to build your faith and have faith for this and this, but also that big thing is read the story. Read where God has come through for the impossible. So when life closes in on you, you read the story. When someone you trusted repays you with dishonesty, when people that you love betray you, read the story. 
When you've been knocked off the mountaintop, climbing back seems almost hopeless. Read the story because there are many people in the Bible that have climbed back up. They've been knocked off, they climb back, knocked off, they climb back up. When the doctor gives you bad news and the bank gives you even worse news, read the story. What do you do with your disillusionment? What do you do with your broken heart? We're not talking inconveniences and hassles or long lines and sobies. We're not talking about, we're not talking, you know, red light or a bad game of tennis. We're talking about heartbreak here. We're talking about real heartbreak, real marriages, people walking away from their relationships of 20, 30 years. We're talking about children in drug addiction. We're talking about accident, cancer, and death. Read the story. Let's stand. Jesus' is cure. Jesus' is cure for the broken heart is the word of God that declares God is still in control. That it's not over until he says so. That's why scripture in the Bible says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, things that were written before, were written for one reason, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. How am I going to have comfort of the scriptures when I'm not even reading a scripture? How am I going to have the comfort of scriptures when I am ignoring scripture? How am I? I mean, I've had count clients ask me, I just want to be comforted. And I'm thinking, well, the scripture is your comfort. You're coming to me for a quick band-aid fix. A counselor cannot fix your problems. I know. I am one. But you know what? The word. Prayer. Come on. I'm, putting, I'm not going to do this. My Prayer. Say, everybody say prayer. Say it out. Prayer. The word. Prayer. Say it. The word. Say it again. Prayer. The word. Prayer. The word. Keep saying it. Prayer. The word. As you say it, walk out. The prayer. Because I'm done. Prayer. Keep saying it. Walk out. The word. I want us. You know what I want tonight to be? I know I could have come out here, Pastor Jack. Sister Woodward. Pastor mad I could have come out here and and talked about how to win multiculturals I think I just did I could have given you step A, step B, step C how to teach Bible study how to be bold, don't be afraid of different cultures, just have them in your apartment, cook a pot of curry and stun them or let them just faint away at the smell and then you can baptize them and they're not looking whatever, I'm just kidding I could have told you step A, step B on how to reach Fredericton and how to reach the neighboring cities and how to, you know, double the size of the church. I think I just did. I think I just did. Because if we don't get back to prayer, then we are going to be going on the last fumes of the, of the dregs of this gas or this petrol or whatever you call it. What do you call it? Gas or petrol? It's the fuel. We're going, to, we're going to have to reset. If some of us have to reset, don't be ever afraid to press a reset button. Never be afraid of that. It's okay. It's okay to press a reset button. It's okay. It's, it's, it's scary because you don't know a lot of things that change. When you press a reset, sometimes you feel, well, I'm going backwards if I press a reset. No, you're not. No, you, you're, you're, you're getting rid of all the things that have cluttered your life. And you are just saying, God, I'm going to wipe it clean slate. And then now you tell me what to prioritize. Car, job, family, bills, or prayer, and then family. And then everything else will work out. I'm not saying put family second. Family is important. My family is very important to me. But if I'm not praying, I'm going to be one useless family member. I'm going to be one irritating family member. Don't anybody ask my brother and sister-in-law. They tell you. I know when she's not praying, she's just a pain. Yeah? No, but I want to win all of them. I want all of them to be drawn to God. I want all of them to have a relation, relationship with God, to pray and to feel his love and mercy. And the only way I'm going to do it is not bug them, but pray. Everybody say, prayer, the word. Prayer, the word. 
at any time and you say, if you want to go and make a commitment right now, I'm going to give it to Pastor Jack in a few minutes, but I want you to make a commitment. You take, find a place, musicians, find a place. Let's have the music, let's have worship, but I want you to find a place and tell God, I'm going to go back to prayer. If I have to spend 15 minutes in the morning, that means I've got to set the alarm. If my day starts at 8 o'clock, you wouldn't want to know what time I really, my day really starts. But my day usually starts at about, um, the, the, my phone starts ringing off the hook at 9. So I've got to be up at 8 in order to get to the office at 9 because my, my counseling clients come around 9, 9, 30, 10. Sometimes and some days is different, but. If, you, if I have to set the alarm, if you have to set the alarm 15 minutes earlier so you can get 15 minutes done, I'm not telling you to do 15 minutes. I'm telling you the bare minimum. And if you can get 15 minutes before you go to bed, that's 30 minutes of Jesus time. And then you can build on that. You can build on that. You say 15 minutes, my goodness, I don't even have 10 minutes to comb my hair. Well, you can start while you're combing your hair. You're not talking to anybody when you're combing your hair. You kind of really get mad with yourself in the mirror. You're like, I'm having a real bad hair day. This is how a bad hair day looks like. You could start then. God doesn't want a particular posture. He's not asking that you always, you have to kneel when you pray or stand or sit. You can be hanging from the rafters. I don't care what you're doing. When you're driving, just talk to God. Combing your hair, talk to God. Vacuuming the carpet, talk to God. Washing the dishes, talk to God. You can get five minutes there, five minutes here, five minutes here, five minutes there, two minutes here, three minutes there, four minutes here, and soon you are praying without ceasing. You see, prayer without ceasing, prayer without ceasing only means this. It means that it's not, it doesn't even mean that you always have to have words coming out of your mouth. Because I think that some of us are worried, well, I've run out of words after two minutes. What am I going to do the re remaining 30 minutes? Well, prayer is not just words coming out of your mouth. Prayer is a constant awareness of God in your life. When you're driving and you are just, you're thinking about Him and His love. You're, you're, you're communicating with Him in different ways. Sometimes you can be exhausted. You're lying on your bed. You can't even move a finger. And if you just say, oh Jesus, I cannot move a finger. I am so tired. You know what you're doing? You're talking to him. You're talking rather than talking to the air or talking to your your boss. You know, in your mind, things you really shouldn't be saying. <laughs> oh Lord, I'm so exhausted. I cannot go on my knees. Will you accept my prayer when I'm lying in bed and I'm just feeling that I just want to tell you to give me a good day today. Make it easy for me today, God. Just make it easy today. Just give me that strength. And you know what you're doing? You're communicating with it. Do you know the rewards of communicating with him even in your little tired voice? The rewards of communicating with him at all. Whether your voice is tired or depressed or angry or despondent or despairing. He hears you because you're talking to him. He hears you immediately. He walks into the room. And when he walks into the room, everything changes. Everything changes. And all of a sudden, you still might be exhausted. But you suddenly feel, you've done it. You know what I'm talking about. You're exhausted, you're tired, you really don't want to have a big prayer meeting right now because you don't have the physical strength to energize yourself to have an intercessory prayer. All you're doing is groaning with exhaustion. But as soon as you communicate and connect with Him, you feel the atmosphere in your spirit change. You're like, oh, thank you for being merciful and loving enough to take my pathetic, tired prayers. He does, you know. He does. I don't know how he quantifies or qualifies prayer. I only know that he wants us to pray and talk to him. And some of us, this is not some criticism because I'm talking to me. In fact, the whole time I was talking to me today. So please don't take this like some kind. Some of us, you prayed at one time. You, it was a default 
default reaction. You, when, when your car stopped or, or you had a, a, a car problem or a relationship problem or job problem, money problem, health problem, your default reaction was prayer. And some of us have come away from that default reaction. Your default now, you know what's default? Default is switch on your computer. Whatever comes, whatever's preset, that's your default. Some of us, your default was prayer. But now your default is not prayer anymore, something else. What is on your wallpaper now? What is your screensaver right now? When you open up, when you open up your, the computer of your life, when you, when you start the day, that's you. What do you think of first? Bills? Facebook? Twitter? Respond to the Twitter? <laughs> I'm going to get that Twitter. How dare she put that on Facebook? I'm going to get her. What is your default? I want you today, as they play, as they sing, when he walks into this room, I want you to get with Jesus right now, wherever you are. Can you find a place, please? Find a place. If you don't want to kneel, that's fine. You want to stand, that's fine. But I wish you would find a place. Can we do that? Just for a few moments. Let's go on. If some of you can, if you want to go on your face, can we do that? Can we just seek after a humble and prostrate ourselves? Just, just a humble demeanor and I want you to tell God God make prayer my default that means every morning when I wake up make prayer my default come on church I want us to take time I know Sunday night tomorrow is a work day I understand but I want you to give Jesus a little bit of time just a little bit of your time He's given us His life. He gave us His blood, His life. He gave us salvation, redemption, deliverance and healing. Peace and joy. Prayer. When you walk into the room, everything changes.